Okay, uh, thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, well, I've been interested in minimal diffeomorphisms and homeomorphisms in dimension two since the very beginning of my PhD at IMPA. And in fact, uh, I'm very interested in, in essentially in this question, in this problem. And my main motivation to study such systems comes from the lack of periodic points of minimal diffeomorphisms, or more generally, homomorphisms. You know, periodic points are extremely useful in dynamics, and at certain extent, minimal diffeomorphisms are uh, the simplest periodic point-free systems. Because when you have minimality, you have certain, a certain form of uh, homogeneity. So if you want to, to understand system with no periodic points, maybe that's a, a good starting point. And the choice of dimension two, of course, comes from the fact that in dimension one, everything is very well understood. I mean, the dynamics of minimal homeomorphisms after Poincaré. And dimension three already is too difficult. You will see that all the results I, I will mention uh, so far, we, we don't have any idea of how to attack the problem in higher dimensions. And in fact, the first problem I considered for my, my PhD thesis was the following one, which can be considered as a very, very weak version of the CR closing lemma. Essentially, the idea is if you have a minimal diffeomorphism, a CR diffeomorphism, if it is possible to, to destroy minimality by arbitrary small CR perturbations. Uh, fortunately, I found some other problems because that one is still open. I mean, I, I, to tell you the truth, it's, I think it's very, we are very far away from, from solving this. And you see it's dimension two, minimality. It's, so far, it's not, not clear how to, to attack this problem. And in that moment, in the beginning of my PhD, I had the naive idea, the naive project of trying to get some kind of classification of minimal diffeomorphisms in dimension two, in dimension two. And so if you are interested in, in finding some kind of, not, maybe not classification, but to find some common characteristic between minimal diffeomorphisms, let's start recalling very well-known examples of minimal diffeomorphisms. Of course, the first one are Ergodic rotations are the fundamental example. In fact, all the time what you do is, when you consider some other system, is to compare the dynamics of, of the diffeomorphism that you are studying with respect to, to the rotation. So this, of course, is the fundamental example. The second kind of examples are time t of reparametrizations of minimal flows. So you start with a minimal linear flow. You consider a reparametrization. The parametrization is still minimal, the flow. And so that means that you have a generic set of times such that the time t is a diffeomorphism. Uh, you have a cohomological condition here. Uh, and if this cohomological equation does not admit continuous solutions, then you really get something new. I mean, something new means different to, to, the, uh, to an ergodic rotation. And in fact, if you have that property, you get quick mixing, for instance. And so it's the, the time t, when it is minimal, it's weak mixing. So you have a, a something new, different to a rotation. OK, the third kind of examples are the celebrated wo work of Furstenberg, which was the first example of a minimal diffeomorphism, which was not uh, uniquely ergodic. Okay? Once again, you have a, a cohomological condition here. You ask to, uh, this cohomological equation, if there is no continuous solution, then automatically you know that the, the skew product, this is an skew product here, is minimal. And if this equation admits a measurable solution, then you have something which is metrically isomorphic to the rotation with alpha zero which is not, of course, it's not ergodic. And so this was another kind of example. And the 
four kind of examples that we will consider here ir irrational then twist. This one is completely different to the first three examples because uh, the first three examples belong to the isotopic class of the identity. They are isotopic to the identity. And this fourth one, it is not. It's isotopic to, uh, sorry, I didn't write here, but it's isotopic to uh, the linear map given by this matrix in T2, okay? So these are probably the, the most well-known examples of minimal uh, diffeomorphisms. And what they have in common, all these examples here, is that they exhibit um, an invariant foliation. You can see in all these examples you have a, an invariant foliation. And this is, of course, is extremely useful because when you have an invariant foliation, you have a one-dimensional transverse structure. And so you, at certain extent, you can reduce the dimension of the manifold. And so it's, it's very desirable to, to have an invariant foliation. So <clears throat> the question is, okay, is it true that any diffeomorphism in T2, minimal diffeomorphism exhibit a, to the, uh, an invariant foliation? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, in 2009, with Andres Koropeki, we showed that uh, if you take the smooth conjugacy class of rotations and you take the infinity closure, this is the typical space where Anos of Katok method work, you show that uh, a generic diffeomorphism exhibits no invariant foliation. And previous, previously, Michel Hermann and Albert Fatih had shown that a generic diffeomorphism here in this space is minimal and uniquely ergodic. So combining these two generic constructions, you can show that there are a lot of diffeomorphisms with no even topological foliation, okay? So at a certain extent, this is a, a bad news because, uh, well, this is uh, some, all the things are a little more complicated than that you can think before. <laughs> Uh, what happened in the isotopy class? Whoops. Stop it. Ah, sorry. What happened in the isotopy class of then twist? Uh, is it true that there are minimal diffeomorphisms with no invariant foliation? Okay, we will return to, to this question here uh, at, the, at the end of this talk. But the question for the answer for question number one is no. Okay? So how you can study minimal diffeomorphisms? How you can continue the, the, the analysis of the dynamics of such systems? Well, let's concentrate in the isotopy class of the identity, okay? In the isotopy class of the identity, you can try to imitate the theory of the, the rotation theory of Poincaré. So not to denote the, isoto the isotopy class of the identity. Uh, when you have a, a homeomorphism, which is isotopic to the identity, any lift to the universal cover uh, can be written as identity plus a C CD periodic function. Okay, this is very classical. And in uh, Poincaré show, showed that when you, have, you are in such a situation, the integral with respect to any invariant measure, to any, is the same, it's always the same. This is the so-called rotation vector, hey, rotation number, sorry. And uh, hence, if, this, if you have this for any uh, invariant measure, that means that this expression must converge uniformly to the rotation number, okay? This is the situation in the one-dimensional setting. In higher dimension, the situation changes uh, a lot. Uh, in general, you cannot expect to have a well-defined rotation vector, but what you have is a rotation set. Again, you are considering the same expression than here, but the difference is that you can have different measures with different integral uh, when you integrate the, the periodic part of the, of the cavern, okay? And so you will say that F is a pseudo-rotation when you have a well-defined rotation vector. When you Um, 
the, the setting in, in higher dimension for to study uh, homeomorphisms, which are isotopic to the identity. And so the question is, okay, what happened with minimum? Yeah, sorry. Well, for instance, a, a good example here is the following. Let's suppose this is the circle, zero, 01. Here in the middle, you have a, any rotate. It's an skew product. And here, you put a completely different rotation. You preserve here. All, and in this direction, you put a north north south dynamics. And so, for instance, in this case, you have every point here has rotation, rotation vector to, in the up direction, here in down. And any other point here has exactly this rotation vector because you converge to this. So this is a very simple example when you have uh, essentially two, uh, only two rotation vectors that, that they are associated to ergodic. You have only here. If this, if this measure, if these are irrational rotations, you have only two invariant ergodic invariant measures, and in this case, the rotation vector uh, is vertical. Uh, this is over the uh, sorry. Imagine this is the zero, and this is the rotation vector of this guy here, and this is the rotation vector of this guy here, and the rotation set is a whole segment here, but you, you only have point with this rotation vector and with this rotation vector. I don't know. It's ah, OK. Ah, sorry. No, no. Uh, yes, for instance, in not, not, not very much. For instance, in this case, when you have minimality and when you have unique ergodicity, you automatically have a, a pseudo rotation. Because you have only one invariant measure, you have only a vector here. And you can see that here, uh, well, I didn't say that, but uh, generic diffeomorphisms here are weak mixing. So you have a pseudo rotation with a completely different uh, dynamics comparing, to, with, comparing with the rotation, with the, with the real rotation. Okay? So yeah, in, in general, it is not to be a pseudo rotation, well, it's not very close to be a rotation. So <coughs> this is a pseudo rotation. So all the examples I mentioned, uh, all four, no, four, sorry, the first three examples that were isotopic to the identity, all of these examples were uh, pseudo rotations. Of course, the rotation, it is clear. Uh, there were parametrization of the flow to show that it's uh, a pseudo rotation is a nice exercise. Um, a skew product of uh, uh, ergodic rotations of the circle are also pseudo rotations. This is a nice exercise. It, it, not, not, not exercise, it's a, it's a problem. This was a lemma proof, proven by Hermann in, in, in some paper of his. But. So uh, all these examples that I mentioned before are pseudo rotations. Okay? So what else? What can we say about? Uh, about the rotation set of a minimal diffeomorphism, or a minimal homeomorphism. You have this theorem of Franks, which is very useful, because as you can see here, I said if you put a, an irrational rotation here and an irrational rotation here, in this example, you have no periodic points, even though you have a lot of rational points in the rotation vector, in the rotation set. So in higher dimension, it is not true that any rational vector is realized by a periodic orbit. But the theorem of Frank said that if the measure is topologically equivalent to Lebesgue, then if, you have a rota if the rotation vector of the measure is rational, then you have a periodic point. So that means that in the case of minimal diffeomorphisms, you know, any invariant measure uh, has no atoms and uh, has no uh, total support. So that means by Oxobi, Ull, and Thornin, it is equivalent to Lebesgue. And so that means that if you have a minimal diffeomorphism, then it cannot contain any rational point. 
In particular, you, we saw the rotation set is a compact convex set, so it must has uh, the the rotation set has empty interior. So essentially, you have two possibilities. You have just a point, so you have a pseudo rotation, or you have a segment, but you cannot have no empty interior for the for the rotation. A segment like this. When the rotation set is not a point, the only two, you have, the rotation set is a compact convex set. So it can be a point, it can be a segment, or it has no empty interior. But it cannot have no empty interior because of this property here. So these are the two possibilities. And in the beginning of 1990s, uh, Franks and Misurevich has conjecture that uh, any minimal diffeomorphism, in fact, any periodic point-free uh, homeomorphism must be a pseudo-rotation. Uh, very recently, uh, Artur Avila has constructed an example of a minimal diffeomorphism which is not uh, a pseudo-rotation. In fact, the rotation, the rotation set uh, is a segment of irrational slope. Okay. So if we were trying to get some kind of classification of minimal diffeomorphism, things are getting worse and worse. Because we have no invariant foliation, the rotation set can be, uh, can be not a point, but maybe a segment. So the situation is much more complicated. But the good news is that these pathologies, in certain way, cannot coexist cannot coexist. So that means that this is a, the first result I want to talk about. If you have a minimal homeomorphism, which is not a pseudo-rotation, then you have something very similar to an invariant foliation. It is not exactly a foliation. Uh, it is a partition of the manifold in sets which, in the universal cover, they are close and connected. And they have a well-defined, um, a well-defined uh, homological direction. So it's very th something like a foliation with leaves having probably some hairs. Something. It's not. Maybe it's not something like this, but probably it's something like this. Something here. Um, maybe some something even worse than this. But okay, it's. They are set in the universal cover that can be written as intersection of nested intersection of strips having a well-defined uh, homological direction. So this is the, the first good news, that you cannot have simultaneously a, a minimal homeomorphism, which is not a pseudo-rotation and with no invariant foliation. It is not a foliation, but it's something similar to that. And the second result is a result with a work in progress with Patrice Le Calfe. <clears throat> and essentially, it answered the, in a topological way uh, the second question I asked before. Uh, if you have a minimal homeomorphism, which is isotopic to a dent twist, then automatically, uh, sorry, automatically exhibit an invariant pseudofoliation. Essentially, what you have is that any minimal homeomorphism in, in, in the isotopy class of dent twist is automatically an extension of a circle minimal uh, rotation, a topological extension. Once again, the fibers can be very, very weird, but you have something like a foliation. You have, uh, you have definitely you have a, a factor. You have a semiconjugacy with the rotation, OK? <clears throat> so uh, how you can study this, this problem of, of invariant foliations and so on? The, the key idea here is the rotational deviations. In the one-dimensional case, you have a very, very nice property, which is uh, uniformly deviation with respect to the rotation 
to the rotation number. That means that if you have a rotation, if you have a circle homeomorphism, anyone, and you consider a lift, then the displacement of any point after n iterates, and if you compare this displacement with the rotation, yes, it can, it can be different from, from zero, but it's always bounded by one. So that means that every point goes with essentially the same uh, mean speed uh, of, of the rotation. In, dimension, in higher dimension, this doesn't hold anymore. And it's very, for instance, it's very instructive to, to see what happened in the Furstenberg case. In the Furstenberg case, in the, in the horizontal direction, you have a rotation, a true rotation. So of course, there is no deviation there. So that means that if you analyze the deviation with, with respect to the rotation, num rotation vector here, and you analyze what happened in the horizontal direction, there is no deviation at all. But on the other hand, you have, un uh, you have unbounded deviation in the vertical direction for every point, for every point. So it, this is a, a typical situation where in, in certain direction it's okay, you have uh, bounded deviation, but unbounded deviation in, in others. And there is a folklore theorem, which is, uh, in fact, it's an easy corollary of uh, Gottschall Hetlund theorem. Gottschall. Hetman theorem that I will need later. If you have a homeomorphism, which is minimal, and you have a continuous function, real continuous function, such that the Birkhoff sum, and uh, sorry, and there exists a point x naught in x, such that the Birkhoff sum uh, of x naught is uniformly bounded is uh, this is uniformly bounded uh, here and exists m for every n. If you have this, then automatically you have that there exists u continuous uh, here such that u f minus u is equal to phi. And this means that if this holds for one point, automatically holds for any other point, not, not exactly with them, but you will have that the Birkhoff sum in any other point is also uniformly bounded. And this is just a consequence of, of this. It's a corollary of this theorem. It said that if you have a certain direction, when you have a bounded deviation with respect to, to the rotation, then you automatically have uh, an invariant pseudo foliation. It is not, as I said before, it's not necessarily a foliation, but it's very something very similar. So, using this theorem here, you will see that if you want to study the existence of invariant pseudo foliations, what you have to do is to, to analyze the problem of rotational deviations. And so, that means that. We will consider the case, for instance, I will consider in this case, where the rotation set is a vertical segment. And we will try to analyze what happened. We will try to show that such a system exhibit bounded deviation in the horizontal direction. Bounded deviation with respect to, to this rotation here, alpha. OK? And this is the way that you, you construct the, the invariant foliage. So, uh, how you can study the problem of rotational deviations. Let's start with this case, which has nothing to do with the minimal case. Because in the, uh, yeah, well, in certain cases it can be. But suppose that you have this. You have the rotation set is contained in the y axis, OK? So if you have such a situation by a classical uh, work of Birkhoff, you can show that you can, you can define this set here, and you can show that it's not empty. What is the idea of this set here? You're saying 
this is the plane. You are considering this is R, the vertical, and you are consider, considering this semi-plane. Okay? And after that, you take the, invar the maximal invariant set of this semi-plane, and this is the connected components, connected components, the unbounded connected components of this invariant set. Okay, and Birkhoff showed that this set are no empty whenever you have this property here. If the rotation set is contained, the, the first coordinate of every rotation vector is zero, then you have that the maximal invariant set here has unbounded components. And that means that this set uh, is not empty, okay? And what's the topology of this set? If your F here exhibit bounded deviation, uniformly bounded deviation, then this set here are very thick in the sense that you have that, you have all this uh, semi-plane containing this set. And this is essentially if the point is here and exhibit bounded deviation, it cannot cross this with some sort of iterate. And when you have unbounded deviations, uh, this cannot happen or, I mean, well, I, I'm cheating a little bit, but you have something like uh, a hertz, okay? It's not, it's not field. They are just hertz. And this is very extremely useful to study the problem of ergodic, to, of rotational deviations, because when you have a invariant set, which, are, uh, which have something like a hertz structure, this imposes certain restriction on the possible dynamics on the vertical direction. And for instance, uh, this set were, were used by uh, Nancy Gelman, Andres Koropecki, and Fabio Tal to, to show that if, there, if you have an area preserving, uh, an area preserving homeomorphism and the rotation set is a vertical segment, then you automatically have a uniformly bounded rotational deviations. There is no chance of having such a hairy invariant set. Okay? Okay, so what happened for minimal homeomorphisms? For minimal homeomorphisms, you know that if f is minimal, then you have this property due to Frank's result. And if it's a, a vertical, segment, you are supposing that it's not a pseudo-rotation, then automatically you have that alpha does not belong to Q. So in particular, it's different from zero. So if you try to imitate the situation in the previ previous slide, and you say, okay, I will try to, to define exactly the same set, you will see that this set is empty. Because everybody, if, if, if suppose that alpha is positive, Everybody is going in this direction, so the inverse goes in this direction, and every point cross, uh, every point escapes from this set. So it is not a good idea, it is empty. So you have to change the definition. Uh, well, okay. So, in fact, what we want to study here. Is the following, uh, we, we are trying to estimate this expression here. This is n alpha. We are trying to estimate the deviation with respect to the horizontal, in the horizontal direction. And so you want to, to estimate this, this quantity here. So one thing that you can do to, to imitate the situation in the, where the rotation set was uh, on the y x axis, sorry, uh, is the following. You could define this set, for instance. And you will have exactly the same thing that you have before. Okay, that means that uh, when if f exhibit, if x, f exhibits bounded deviation, then you have a thick set like this. And if it's, if it's exhibit unbounded deviation, then you have a hairy set, but it's not empty. So it's this definition, this attempt of definition is much better than this one. But there is a problem. This set is not dynamically defined. It is not invariant, I mean, by anything. Right? So it's not very useful to, to do dynamics. 
It's not an, an F invariant set. It is not an F invariant set. So you have the set, you have something very similar to a previous case, but it seems to be rather hard to use it to get any result. So what can we do is the following. First of all, they will work in the area preserving case. Minimal homeomorphisms, you can suppose that they are area preserving because you can conjugate to, to preserve Lebesgue. This is sox toby ulam theorem. I will consider the space of, uh, of lifts of area preserving homeomorphisms, which are isotopic to the identity. And you have, in this case, you have the rotation vector of Lebesgue. This is exactly the same definition I used before. But in this case, you have a group homeomorphism. OK? So you have a group homomorphism. And the kernel of these group homomorphisms are the so-called Hamiltonian homomorphisms. Homeomorphisms, sorry. That mean, I mean, I just consider this as a definition. A Hamiltonian homeomorphism is a, uh, is a homeomorphism such that the rotation preserve uh, its area preserving, and the rotation set of the rotation vector of Lebesgue is zero. And when you have such a situation here, you have a simple uh, group theoretical remark that is that this uh, short exact sequence split. This essentially means that here, this projection here has an inverse. Forget it, it's not important. What is in interesting here is that the symplectic homeomorphism or area preserving homeomorphisms can be written as a direct product, se semi direct product of R2 and Hamiltonians. And when in algebra you have a semi direct product, in dynamics you have a skew product. So if you consider this a composition here, you can construct a skew product, which is very useful for dynamics in the following way. You consider an area preserving homeomorphism and a lift. And let, and let, write rho, let us write rho for the rotation vector of Lebesgue. In this case, and then you can define the following map, which is an skew product over T2 times R2. This is essentially motivated by the previous formula, that I, uh, the previous remark I said, that symplectic uh, homeomorph, the, the group of symplectic homomorphisms can be written as a semi-direct product of R2 and Hamiltonian homeomorphisms. So you have this structure here. And notice that the interesting point here is this. This is a Hamiltonian, this is a Hamiltonian homeomorph homeomorphism. And why this is interesting for us? Well, you can write, if you write the lift in this way, you, will, you can easily show that you have this expression here. And that means that when you take the n iterate, you have this property. Forget about the, the, the first coordinate. Consider the second property. The second coordinate is exactly what you want. You want to iterate n times. You are iterating here, and you are pushing back to, to the origin in a certain way. So this expression here is always Hamiltonian. So that's the reason why I define this as a Hamiltonian skew product. You have, on the base, you have a rotation. And on the fiber, you have Hamiltonian homeomorphisms. So that means that you can now apply exactly, no, not exactly, but you can define the, the Birkhoff stable sets using this skew product. You know, because suppose that the rotation set, so is alpha a, b. You consider, once again, the ver vertical semiplane. And now you define, for each t, you will have a fiber invariant set. For each, for each t in t2, you consider exactly the same set, but now for the skew product. And you intersect this invariant set with the fiber over t. And you consider the unbounded, uh, unbounded connected components on this set. It seems to be a rather cumbersome in, in certain way, but on the other, but on the other hand, you, you have this. This is really an F invariant set. This is a dynamically defined set. 
So <coughs> uh, the, taking the union or, on each fiber, you have a, a dynamically defined set. And now you can try to, to get exact, the, the same result you had before, you, are, you can try to get here. Uh, the first remark is the following. Of course, we are trying to prove the theorem A, so we are trying to show that we have a uniformly bounded deviation with respect to alpha in the, in the horizontal direction. So let's suppose that this is not the case. Suppose that you have unbounded uh, deviation. And due to the gottschall hetlun theorem, you can suppose, if you want, that you have one point with unbounded. Because if you, if, yeah, you have one point with unbounded deviation. In this case, well, uh, in fact, to prove that the set is not empty, you, it is not necessary to have unbounded deviation. But you, in this case, you have that the, this set are not empty. OK, this is OK. The second case is also rather easy. If you are considering the maximal invariant set with respect to, uh, to this semiplane, of course, is, uh, this contains the maximal invariant set starting here to the right. This is clear. But the two fundamental properties are the following. If you take R very, very negative in this way, and you take the union, you have something dense. And on the other hand, due to gottschall hetlund theorem, if you have a maximal invariant set by the right and by the left, they cannot intersect. Because if you have one intersection, you have a point with uniformly bounded deviation, and if you have a point with uniformly bounded deviation, you have every point with uniformly bounded deviation. So you have a two hairy invariant set, such that if you translate in this direction, you get a dense set. If you translate in this direction, you have a, 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 a dense set, but they don't intersect. They don't intersect. So it, you start to see that it's very particular. This. Um, the idea of the proof is that, so always assuming this, uh, this, unif this unbounded deviation, the first thing is that you can show that the, the homeomorphism, the original homeomorphism, is spreading. What is spreading is something stronger than topologically mixing. In fact, what you can show is that you take any invariant set, uh, sorry, if you take any small set U and you take a ball of radius R, very large, and you take epsilon very small, then you have, after some time n, for every uh, my, uh, small n, you have that this set, the, or, the n iterate of this set, is epsilon dense in a ball of radius R. So, this is in the, in the universal cup. So you have something which is much stronger than topologically mixing. For instance, in the Anosov case, you always have mixing, but always along the direction of the unstable, of the unstable direction. Here you are getting a, a mixing in every, every homological direction. And how you can prove this, essentially, this, the, it's rather complicated. This was a result of a student of mine uh, in Brazil. Uh, the idea is that you have this Hayley structure. Here, this is this set of minus infinity, and you have some Hayley structure here from plus infinity. And you have, in, inside the set U, you have point that goes up and point that goes down. And, to, and you have to avoid this set here if you, you started Initially, you, you have chosen you, the joint of this set. You have to avoid, the, avoid this, and so that means that the image of you have to, uh, to oscillate a lot. This is essentially the, the, the idea of the proof. And secondly, <coughs> uh, you have this, the horizontal, uh, the horizontal set. And you can also define the vertical set. It's essentially the same thing. Here, you are considering not this semiplane here, but this semiplane. 
for instance, the upper one. And you can show that this set is also non-empty, but the argument is completely different to the Birkhoff argument. This is a combination of Lefschetz fixed Horn theorem, a, a result of Patrice Le Calvé and Jean-Christophe Yocos for iterates, for the index of iterates of isolated fixed points, and another theorem of Frédéric Leroux uh, about the, also the index of, of iso not, not isolated, sorry, of fixed point. But combining these three results, you can show that this set is uh, non-empty. And due to the spreading condition, you have two Heide sets in this direction, you have two Heide sets in this direction, and all these sets are disjoint. They cannot intersect. I mean, this third argument is a very how you say, crafty argument. It's not, it's not easy at all. But you get a contradiction from the existence of this fourth set that cannot intersect. Um, well, I have three minutes, yeah, or something like this. Um, for, the, for the case of, of the dent twist, the argument is similar. In, at first, we thought that the dent twist should be harder, but in fact, it's easier. The argument is, is less involved. Uh, so you have, when you have a homeomorphism which is isotopic to the identity, the, sorry, to the dent twist of this form here, any lift have the following form here. In this case, you cannot consider the rotation vector because this function here is not a co-cycle. For the, uh, for the homeomorphism. But this one is a cosine. So you can imitate the, the rotation theory. Uh, you can define, in this case, the, vect the vertical rotation uh, set, essentially in the same, the same way. OK, when I say when this is a cosine, I mean that if you take the n iterate here, here what you get is the Birkhoff sum. And in this case, it is not true. Here, you don't have the Birkhoff sum. OK? Or, or not, not the same or what? Uh, this, the problem is this M here. So you have the vertical rotation set. And there is a recent result of Salvador Adasanata, Garcia, and, and Fabio Tal, who show that if you have a minimal homeomorphism, which is homotopic to the twist, then the rotation set is just a point. And this point is Russian. This point is Russian. So what happened here? Well, you can construct a very similar skew product. The problem is that the skew product now, uh, it doesn't exist on T2 times R2, but it works in T times the open annulus. Essentially, the, the formula is the same. You are also using this idea of the semi-direct product. Here, you will see that here, if, if your homeomorphism is area preserving, it's area preserving, yes, and this is a vertical rotation vector, you will have here something which, is, which has a zero rotation number with respect to Lebesgue. So you are pushing all the time uh, things down. And so you can define exactly the same set, but in this case, you define the vertical set. And, well, assuming that you have unbounded vertical deviations, uh, you show that the set are non-empty, closed, and unbounded. And using the argument, once again, of minimality, you can show that this, the sets from below and from, from above are disjoint. So they have non-empty interior. And again, you have the same property that the translates are dense. And, well, essentially, this is the, the whole idea. Because when you have, for instance, when you have a twist map, a, a real twist map, there is, there is no invariant set like this, like that one. I mean, if you have an unbounded invariant set for a twist map with zero, yeah, a completely invariant set, automatically, they, it is the neighborhood of infinity. I mean, it's completely filled. But in this case, it is not necessarily true that it is a twist map, but when you regard uh, a homeomorphism which is isotopic to the identity, if you look them from very far away, 
it seems to be a twist map. So you can repeat some arguments here and to show that uh, this is not the case. Thank you very much.